Hi all, for our notable game today, I thought we could have a look at another Fisher memorable game. So in the classic book, 60 memorable games. There was a game featured against Samuel Rozevsky. In fact, Rozevsky is featured four times. So statistically, yeah, only certain opponents managed to get four games in the book and Rozevsky was one of them. Samuel Rozevsky uh, was uh, born in 1911 and he died in 1992. He was a Polish chess prodigy and later a leading American chess grandmaster. Never a full-time chess professional, but he was a strong contender for the World Championship from the mid-1930s to the mid-1960s. He came equal third in the 1948 World Chess Championship Tournament and equal second in the 1953 Candidates Tournament. An eight-time winner of the US Chess Championship, outstanding match player throughout his career, he excelled in positional play and could be a brilliant tactician when required. He had a reputation for taking a very long time over his opening moves and often found himself under severe time pressure, which often unsettled his opponents more than actually Rozevsky himself, an accountant by profession and a well-regarded chess writer. Now, once Fischer entered the scene at age 14, uh, it left Rozevsky behind a bit uh, in the US Championship um, in 1957-58, Fischer dominated completely, uh, leaving Rozevsky the seven times former champion back in the chasing pack. And apparently there was there was a bit of tension developing between the two, separated by a generation in age. Uh, in fact, Rozevsky's quoted as saying in Buenos Aires' 1960 tournament, I would settle for 19th place if Fischer was 20th. So it's a bit of fun rivalry, uh, but it actually went more more than that. Actually, uh, the thing is, the tension between them. Uh, there's there's a section on wiki with the tension between uh, Fischer and Rozevsky, and actually, it did actually become one of the fiercest rivalries in chess history. Apparently, up until the, that time, uh, and in fact. Um, Rozevsky didn't play on the Chess Olympiad teams of 1960, 62 and 66 because Fischer, US champion, as US champion was chosen ahead of him for top board. They finally played in 1970 in the Chess Olympiad and that was the only time they appeared on the same team. So there's a bit of sadness there between this emerging, well, gigantic chess kind of rivalry and tension. Uh, but the thing is, Fischer did respect him, especially in the mid-1950s. Rozevsky had actually won a mini-match against Botvinnik, and around that time, uh, Fischer definitely had uh, great respect for him. Um, Rozevsky is also kind of unique. He's, he's one of the few players to have played 11 of the first 12 world chess champions, from Emmanuel Lasker to Anatoly Karpov. The only player to do so, he met Kasparov but never played him, so he defeated seven of the world champions, Lasker, Kampablanka, Anakine, Erva, Botvinnik, Smyslov, and Fischer. So, okay, let's have a look at this game, which actually is also regarded as a kind of tiebreaker game, because they had this match scheduled, which was, uh, they had two wins each and seven draws. It was something like five and a half, it was five and a half each. And this was like a year later, it was kind of regarded as the final game of that virtual match. So that's kind of interesting as well. So let's see. So E4 from Fisher. This is 1962, New York, US Championship. And Rozevsky playing black played the Sicilian defense. We have Knight F3, D6. And you might think it's a bit strange. Rozevsky's playing the Neidorf, which Fisher's obviously a narrow specialist and was getting a reputation surely by this time as well as being a quite an exponent of this line. And interestingly here on move six, Fischer chooses h3. And this is very rare for the time. But uh, in recent years, Caruana and Fischi Anand have been playing h3 here. It's not such a bad move. It's positionally motivated. Uh, a bit, bit like uh, B Basman enters enters opening ideas because it's the grob is g4 on move one, but uh, like a delayed grob, you can fin chair to the bishop, you can exert pressure on d5, you can kick the knight. It's got a few things going for it. 
as long as you haven't uh, committed the bishop yet the bishop can also neatly fincetto we have g6 g4 and here after bishop g7 uh, usually bishop g2 is, is played here in live 86 games Fisher chooses the more forcing move g5 which does weaken a bit this f4 square and black now has an idea potentially to play e5 and knight f4 later which would kind of try and create a nice square on e5 as well as hit the g5 pawn disconnect that g5 pawn we have bishop e2 and this idea is now in place we have e5 one slight positional issue with playing e5 though is that d5 square so can white actually establish an outpost piece later on d5 let's see how the game evolves knight b3 and now with the bishop attacked it does go to f4 and perhaps it would be unwise for white to take this although tempting for example taking queen d2 keeping an eye on this and also attacking this you might think is a good idea but this position after queen takes g5 queen takes actually could be favorable for black positionally with the e5 square if black snaps off c3 plays knight d7 that e5 square is actually very nice here so that would be positionally quite comfortable for black so here actually after knight f4 knight d5 was played and you get a sense for many of fisher's moves here an echo of to take is a mistake if you give your opponent something a little bit of something which could be used for an advantage so fisher resisting the temptation to take a piece here and offering the temptation to take here and we'll see this echoed a number of times actually in this game black does take on d5 queen takes d5 so there's a temporary queen outpost here for the moment the queen can't be kicked back b7 will be hanging knight c6 so bishop e6 now might be on the cards and if the queen drops back to d3 and then there's knight b4 so the queen is potentially subject to useful harassment and here fisher does offer another piece to be taken but what does it give superficially yes it doubles white's pawns but isn't this rook slightly more active on the h file black did actually take care but if he doesn't if black just castles then this is quite comfortable the queen as an outpost on d5 without the issue of bishop e6 existing is not so bad here so anyway so black did take on g4 h takes g4 so we have an interesting dynamic pawn structure double pawns here queen outpost on d5 more difficult to kick now this rook file could be useful for both rooks eventually the rooks love the files even if the pawns are temporarily shattered we have queen c8 which not only hits g4 but threatens knight b4 and knight takes c2 check that's addressed with queen going back to d1 keeping an eye on d6 as well of course knight d4 and here again a temptation to take care will give black a little bit of something maybe the e5 square later and it blunts of course the default pressure so white offers again a piece for black to take giving white a little bit of something knight takes b3 a takes b3 and we're getting an almost an amusing pawn structure now double pawns on both sides of the board and rooks enjoying their fouls black the black rooks by contrast a little bit more passive black does have a structural defect himself the backward d pawn which is attended to with queen e6 and now we have a move rook a5 so not minding about b3 uh pressure well the queen is, is protecting b3 at the moment but here with rook a5 queen d5 is a supported outpost to be exchanged with a rook outpost if the rook can recapture on d5 and black here played f6 so volunteering to undouble white's pawns it seems white is on the verge of a, a mighty grip on this position if left unchallenged uh, you might think this is a strange decision f6 but there's also the possibility of rook d5 here in fact as well if if say castles 
rook d5 this looks very pleasant indeed how is this outpost rook challenged so f6 actually affords though the opportunity to play queen d5 here not worrying about g4 d6 is attacked as well so queen takes d5 rook takes d5 we have simplification but white's rooks are attacking weak points in black's position h7 and d6 here we have king d7 and now g takes f6 bishop takes now g5 cramping these two pawns so this pawn restricting both of those pawns bishop e7 king e2 so what's going on here if the rook comes to e3 maybe then white will try and restrain black's pawns on the queen side and also try and coordinate the rooks either with an h file doubling or even coming back maybe to the a file to enjoy this a file pressure if black ever plays the b pawn then this pawn will be a target as well as this pawn so potentially there's multiple targets in this position and also lurking behind the scenes is an idea of playing f4 f5 f6 as if ever e takes when the bishop is on the e3 then bishop d4 to win h7 it's another lurking idea we have rook a f8 which stops f4 because also tactically there might be some possibilities immediately so it kind of cramps down against white's f4 but bishop e3 now and if black doesn't do anything another plan for white here is simply to dissolve these double pawns as these were dissolved just then but now there's also b4 b5 to consider rook c8 and it seems after b4 white is serious about b5 potentially that could be useful to create another target on b7 it also of course stops rook c5 for the moment black's under great pressure here he's got a lot of pressure to deal with and another pressure point target is going to be created as well as dissolving the double pawns it seems so black's reaction is to play b5 here nevertheless yes another target is born with b5 a backward a pawn so potentially white can work on the h pawn the a pawn d6 and also have f4 behind the scenes for bishop d4 there are numerous targets here rook d d1 was played king e6 and now rook a1 and it's difficult for black to defend this pawn that easily for the moment he plays rook c6 and now rook h3 so threatening to switch quickly to attack h7 how does black actually defend h7 in this position and this shows actually the power of f4 because you might think in this position after rook h3 the king could attend to this pawn in fact that's difficult if king f7 this wasn't played uh, in the game bishop f8 was played but if king f7 if we double rooks here then we can play f4 and it's very strong with the idea of f5 and f6 so if takes we have bishop d4 check so this position is just crushing for example positioning murderous so black here is in a bad way he plays bishop f8 after rook a h1 yes he's defending for the moment with rook c7 that's a resourceful defense the snag is here that black is getting increasingly tied down and after fisher's next move is facing severe difficulties defending on both sides of the board h7 and a6 can you guess the quiet but crushing move that fisher plays in this position at move 30 if i give you five seconds to pause the video here okay rook h4 <laughs> keeping the battery and saying to black your turn black's nearly in zugzwang here you might wonder why well how does black defend a6 and h7 here consistently if rook c6 then we snap off on h7 if rook f7 then we can play rook a1 how to, how to defend a6 here the bishop's controlling a7 
so it's it's getting tricky it's getting very very tricky here after rook h4 black played d5 trying to at least get some king activity it's a bit double edge getting king activity sometimes the king is subject potentially to mating nets that's one thing to bear in mind and Fisher ignores d5 for the moment he actually plays rook a1 here hitting a6 yes so there's various other possibilities now that have emerged although that move seems to have rescued the situation materially for the moment after rook c6 white now can play e takes d5 and there's an isolate pawn in the position rook d1 check and there's an infiltration of the rook to the eighth rank now while not statistically as as amazing usually as a rook to the seventh the rook on the eighth in this position is a nasty pin we have king f5 and now rook a8 so not only pinning the bishop but attacking that weak point so all the weak points are really being attacked by white's very very active aggressive rooks so this is what happens when you accept double pawns when you encourage your opponent to take your pieces you can get these these increases in piece activity and here it's it's just a terrible bind blacks in rook e6 we have rook h3 now threatening potentially rook f3 that could be very useful winning a piece bishop g7 getting out of the way of that but losing a pawn now it was very very difficult for black in this position the king has become a tactical target so yes losing the first pawn now rook takes h7 rook e8 check and now after f3 check the king is wandering a bit too far perhaps after king g3 in this position there was actually a technical win which even the mighty fisher well he found another way of winning the position a very strong move as well but there's actually a very clinical way of winning this position if i give you five seconds what would you play here with white so five seconds to pause the video now white to play okay the clinical way to win this is king f1 with the idea of bishop f2 check king going uh say to h2 and then there's rook h7 mating or king h3 there's b rook h7 mating the exit squares are all like taken so the black king really is the mating there so fisher could have ended this game very very quickly with king f1 here instead on move 41 we have king d3 okay so after king d3 this is really terrible for black in any case the king's uh, potentially coming to this great square on e4 uh, and torture will be resumed we have now e4 check giving up another pawn check bishop d4 king g4 is black going to get his pawn at least one pawn back we have rook f1 and now bishop e5 king e3 unpinning threatening bishop takes e5 bishop drops back check king h4 and now king f3 it's close to mating that time again with bishop f2 on the cards very close to mating that time and here you might think after rook d7 why wasn't bishop f2 check played here again it looks like isn't it at least winning a piece if black is forced with bishop h2 you're right that is another way of uh, skinning the cat here bishop f2 check but e5 is very strong as well as played bishop f2 check this this position does actually spell not mate by force but seemingly basically winning a piece in this line and having to give it back here though this this is awkward so having to give it back but basically getting a winning pass pawn in any case 
so that was a strong move but not clear-cut winning a piece just to get a winning pass pawn so Fisher's move in effect does the same sort of thing e5 this is a winning pass pawn here we have check the king coming active to support the pawn potentially rook f5 e6 so e7 is immediately threatened and then black would not be able to stop that queening bishop d8 and now breaking the blockade with bishop f6 at the cost of a pawn is a natural thing to do bishop takes g takes no blockade on e7 now e8 rook takes for the moment some caution you don't want this check king d5 so e7 now threatened rook f2 trying to get behind the pawn that stops with rook e1 and here it's clear it's it's actually fairly hopeless Rzewski resigned in this position let's have a quick look basically if the rook goes back the white king can basically munch the rook and if if the black rook pardon me if the black rook uh, goes over here then white has time to just take um, a pawn in this position or do worse let's put on the kibitza here you, you might think this is going to draw hold on a sec i think we can just snap a pawn off here first and then just get behind the pawn and then here b3 so yeah there's no time here we're just going to create a pass pawn there and sat the rook if needed so yeah it's a pretty hopeless um end game position there so the pass pawn is winning in this position no no point playing further so an interesting game now what do we take from this game well it seems fisher's h3 was far ahead of its time or maybe anand and caruana in 2015 have been looking at Fisher games and thinking actually this isn't such a bad idea but uh, yeah it presents pretty concrete challenges uh, especially in the more forcing continuation Fisher shows with g5 it seems White's offerings gave him double pawns on both sides of the board which led to active rooks on both sides of the board which led to multiple targets on both sides of the board and a kind of virtual zugzwang at some point in the game which caused black to sort of try and break out with d5 which did cause some king safety issues and near, near mating nets which were not exploited as accurately one might think but nevertheless fisher ended up pawns up and all he needed was one winning pass pawn in the end the goal of chess is to win you just need one pass pawn and it's clearly winning in the final position a very interesting game in it was featured in uh, Fisher's classic 60 memorable games book as well but yeah a fierce rivalry undertone provides the context for this game so that makes it extra interesting I think when there's a fierce rivalry and there definitely was but it had unfortunate implications as I say for the US teams at, at Olympiads for certain years so fascinating stuff Rzewski by the way was in a, an iconic photo on wiki as a child prodigy he was doing these simultaneouses his parents encouraged him to do these big simultaneouses against adults and it's pretty stunning how he did that even as a little kid he had massive potential uh, but um, okay comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much